a real pleasure to be here at uh, uh, in Wichita, and uh, I know we've said it a couple times, but we can't say it too many times. Um, Eric, what a wonderful job you have done putting this whole thing together. It's been absolutely, absolutely amazing. So, okay, we've got a lot of material to cover, so let's uh, get uh, going. Uh, today I'm going to be speaking on the hidden history of the electric guitar, or everything you know is wrong. That's actually not true, but I like to say that because it sounds dramatic. So, okay. Let's see if this works. Yay, shorts. Good yeah, things. Okay, wait, what's the... So, sorry, Matthew, let me see what the... Typically, with the... That would be that. great. I'm going to click at you. Okay, <laughs> we're going to do this analog, um, electromechanically. So uh, I'll, I will, I will do this electrically, and you will do that mechanically. So okay, great. Almost without question, the invention of the electric guitar is the most important development in musical instruments during the last century. No other musical instrument can claim to have had the impact on music and society of the last hundred years that the electric guitar and its variants have had. While the electric guitar's origins and early history have been the subject of much heated debate and the source of much mythology, it is now generally acknowledged that the first commercially successful electric guitar was the electro frying pan invented by George Beecham and manufactured in collaboration and corporate partnership with Adolf Rickenbacker by the Brooke Patton Corporation, later known as the Electro String Corporation, and known today as Rickenbacker International Corporation. The technology that Beecham implemented and refined for the frying pan is the basis for the overwhelming majority of electric stringed instruments that have come after. Although electric guitars are ubiquitous today, their history, especially their early history, remains obscure and not well understood. This lack of understanding holds true not only for the general public, but for musicians and music historians as well. This state of affairs is particularly true for the events that led up to and drove the development of the electric guitar, the prehistory of the electric guitar, if you will. Today I will show you some of this hidden history of the electric guitar and discuss the electric guitar's place in the wider perspective of electric musical instruments. I will also discuss some of the driving forces behind the development of the electric guitar and how these forces are actually quite different from what is typically today assumed about the instrument's history. So let's go back, way back. Most people think of electric musical instruments as something modern, but the, electric ap but the application of electricity to musical instruments dates back more than 250 years. What the first electric instrument, or sorry, what the first electrified instrument was has been the subject of some speculation, but it's most often identified as the Denny Door, which translates as Golden Dionysus, a keyboard instrument constructed around 1748 by the Czech priest Václav Prokop Divish, sometimes known as Prokopius Divish who lived from 17, or sorry, 1698 to 1765. Diebisch was an early electrical experimenter. In 1754, he erected an early type of lightning rod, which he possibly invented independently of Benjamin Franklin, on church property near his home, near Primitrius, near Zinomjo, in the South Moravian region, close to the Austrian border of what is now the Czech Republic. Around 1748, uh, Divish created the Denny door and named it for himself. The Denny in the name is the French equivalent of the Czech surname Divish, both of which derive from the Greek god Dionysus. It was a stringed instrument operated by a keyboard approximately 150 centimeters long by 90 centimeters wide by 120 centimeters high, or roughly the size of a modern spinet style upright piano. 
The mechanism was extremely complicated, having over 790 strings arranged into 14 stops or registers, and the instrument was said to be able to imitate the sounds of the harpsichord, harp, lute, and even wind instruments by various combinations of stops. Unfortunately, there are no drawings of this instrument, but a description of the instrument written in 1753 indicates that the strings were struck rather than plucked. However, most of the, the most unusual feature of the instrument was that it employed electricity, supplied by means of batteries or Leyden jars. It's not clear which. The electricity was used for two purposes. The first was to somehow energize the, and I put that in quotes, energize, the iron strings of the instruments, which in turn enhanced the sound produced. And the second was to enable Divish to give the unsuspecting player of the Denny door an electric shock. The second function is not as strange as it first might appear. Uh, some of the first practical applications of electricity were actually practical jokes. That is, they were the, uh, used um, in the creation of novelties which buzzed or shocked the unwary recipient. It is not clear how either of these electrical features worked, but it is clear that the author of the 1753 description considered the Denny door to be an electrisch musicalisch instrument, pardon my attempts at German, that is, an electric musical instrument, which is the earliest known use of the term. After Diebisch's death in 1765, the Denny door was sold and taken to Vienna. Its eventual fate is unknown. Sadly, there is no clear description of the acoustic effect that the use of electricity had on the strings, which makes it difficult to determine or even speculate on any possible circuitry of the instrument. The next known musical instrument to employ electricity was the clavecin électrique, invented by Jean-Baptiste Thialis de la Borde in 1759. De la Borde, like Divish, was also a priest. Played by means of a conventional keyboard, the instrument's mechanism was activated electrostatically by using a glass globe-type generator which produced, uh, produced electricity by way of friction. The static electricity thus generated is simultaneously of low continuous flowing curtain, uh, current and high voltage. In essence, the clavecin electrique was an electrically activated carillon using bells as the sound producers, with the main difference being that the two bells were employed for each pitch. Both bells were electrically charged with a metal clapper suspended between them. <coughs> when the key lever is depressed, one of the bells is earthed which causes the metal clapper to violently swing back and forth between the earth and unearth bells, producing the pitch, uh, sounding not unlike a mid-20th century mechanical alarm clock. It should be noted that Delaborde did not discover the electric principle used in the device's mechanism, which was based on existing uh, alarm bell type devices. Delaborde published his description and account of the clavecin electrique in 1761, noting that the instrument was particularly effective when played in the dark, due to the brilliant sparks produced by the instrument while it was played. Unlike the Denny door, which appears to have utilized electricity mostly as a novelty or gimmick that was adjunct to the instrument's musical functions, the clavecin electrique's utilization of electricity was an essential part of its mechanism. Delaborde invention was pretty much the first fully electrically powered musical instrument. So um, if you would hit the uh, little um, the sound thing, we can hear a little bit of what this sounds like. Now what you're hearing is a recreation of the uh, instrument that was made in 2009. And um, uh, the synthesizer was obviously not part of it. Um, and you'll notice that when you hear the bells being played, the higher the pitch is, the faster the oscillation between the uh, two, the two, the bell striking is. So somebody made one of these based on this drawing. I'm sorry. They made this based on this drawing. They, they made one of these based on the drawing. Made one. I don't know.
Oh, oh yes, yes, it was based, based, on, yes, based on this drawing, okay. yes. Uh, the only difference between the reproduction and the, um, and, and the drawing is that his original drawing specifies the bells being mounted on the wall. And that was so that the wall, he, he specifies a stone wall that was earthed. And so he uses the, uh, you know, uses the natural grounding of the, of the building to do it, where the reproduction uses a, you know, modern, like, electrical ground. They fudged a little bit, but it gives the idea. Is that enough for everybody? So, and you can yell. George Breed's Electrified Guitar of 1890. In 1890, a United States Naval officer named George Breed patented a design for an electrified guitar. You notice I say electrified and not electric, and we will get to that in a moment. Um, electrified guitar, which appears to be the first application of electricity to a fretted stringed instrument. Like the modern electric guitar, Breed's patent was based on a vibrating string in an electromagnetic field. Breed's design, though, worked on very different electrical and musical principles, resulting in a guitar with, unconventional, with an unconventional playing technique that produced an exceptionally unusual and unguitar-like, continuously sustained sound. At the beginning of 1890, Breed was attached to the newly commissioned uh, cruiser, the USS Baltimore, the flagship of the North Atlantic Fleet. Within four weeks of joining the crew of the Baltimore, Breed had filed his pe guitar patent application. Six months later, on 5th of July, 1890, Breed resigned from the Navy to take effect from 7th of January, 1891, with leave given until that date. On September 2nd, 1890, Breed was granted U.S. patent number 435679 for his method of an apparatus for producing musical sounds by electricity, less than two months after his effective resignation from the Navy. Whether these two events are related is not known, but it's tempting to speculate that the reason George Breed left the Navy was to make and market his musical instrument designs. In considering Breed's patent, it's important to remember that Breed was not patenting so much a specific musical instrument design as he was a method of setting a string into constant vibration. In Breed's patent, musical instruments are not the only application depicted. The patent shows the principle applied to a keyboard, a guitar, and as a signaling device. To set the string in motion, Breed's design makes use, of an, makes use of an electromagnetic principle known as the Lorenz force. In essence, the Lorenz force principle states that when an electrically charged particle moves through a magnetic field, there is a force on it that is perpendicular to the direction of its movement and to the north-south axis of a magnetic field. In Breed's patent, a metal string is stretched through a strong magnetic field provided by an electromagnet, which encircles the string. It should be noted that the electromagnet does not share the same circuitry as the string, each having independent circuits. In fact, it's not necessary that the magnet be an electromagnet at all, a fact that Breed indirectly acknowledges by depicting a non-electrified horseshoe magnet in his initial illustration showing the principle of the design, uh, which is right here. Is this you can see here that he's just showing a typical horseshoe magnet of the time. However, in Breed's day, permanent magnets were incapable of producing a magnetic field of the strength required, and strong permanent magnets, such as the Alnico type, were a number of years into the future. The string, in addition to its conventional function as an acoustic source, is also an integral, integral part of the design circuitry as a direct current, DC, passes through it. I want you to think about that for a second. This electric current is intermittently interrupted at rapid, yet irregular intervals, producing a pulsed direct current, which sets the string in motion by the rapid engaging and disengaging of the Lenorenz force created when the current is flowing through the string. This pulsed DC which is, and again, this is pulsed DC. This is not the same thing as alternating current. 
Uh, some people have mistaken for that. It is, it's still DC. It's just being turned on and off very quickly. Uh, this pulse DC, which is created by the rapid interruption of the string current, string's current, mimics some of the properties of, but is not the same as, alternating current, which in 1890 was yet to be widely used. Reed likens this rapid uh, making and breaking of the circuit to the effect of a metal pin being drawn across a file. His analogy is quite vivid, stating that a softer tone is produced with a finely cut file, while a coarser file generates a rougher sound. This suggests that the use uh, the, the, that this suggests that the use of files as part of the circuitry may have been based on Breed's personal experience and perhaps performed part of the initial discovery process. In the patent, Breed creates a, the rapid making and breaking of the electrical circuit by the use of a rotating wheel with randomly spaced contact points on its outer edge, which he calls a brake wheel. Breed recommends that this brake wheel should either be turned by clockwork or alternatively powered by a small electric motor, which of course would create a third circuit in this uh, contraption. Um, uh, let me see, uh, powered by a small electric motor attached to the same battery as the electromagnet. Although not explained in the patent, the non-regularity of the pulsations and the string's electrical current is an important factor in the performance of the instrument. Pulsations that are too regular, which would, would cause the instrument body to resonate in a much more pronounced manner at those frequencies that match the rate of uh, pulsation, thus producing prominent wolf tones and making the instrument acoustically imbalanced. The first uh, use of the method that Breed describes in his patent is as a signaling device. In fact, Breed suggests that the circuitry of his design lends itself particularly well to telegraphy and that it allows simultaneous transmission of multiple signals on the same wire. The circuit described in this part of the patent difference, differs from the patent's musical applications in several respects. The most noteworthy of these is the use of two separate sets of strings, one as transmitters and the others as receivers, which you can see here and here, uh, tuned to the same set of pitches. Unlike the other applications described in the patent, the signaling device makes no use of a brake wheel. Instead, a flexible platinum contact point is used, which is connected to the main circuit at the transmitting strings. A telegraph key-like device is connected to the same part of the circuit, which, as long as it remains closed, creates the rapid pulsations of current created by the brake wheel in Breed's other applications. The pulsations thus created are registered on the corresponding string at the receiving end by a telegraph sounder activated by a circuit triggered by a key-like device which is set in motion by the vibration of the receiving string. The transmitted signal only registers on the receiving string of corresponding pitch, having no effect on the other strings. It should be noted, for each pair of matched pitch signaling strings, there are four independent circuits, one for each of the electromagnets on the sending and receiving end, the circuit connecting the, second, the sending and receiving strings, and the circuit powering the telegraph sounder. However, an obvious drawback to the system is the need to maintain the same pitch, which I will, I will show you could be problematic due to the heat generating detuning of the strings on the corresponding sending and receiving strings. The greater part of the patent concerns the application of Reed's method to musical instruments, and he gives examples of its application to the piano and the guitar. The design for the piano shown in the patent is more of an example of the possibilities of the circuit as applied to the keyboard instrument, rather than a fully realized instrument design. It's pretty clear that he never actually made this piano. Um, it's immediately apparent that the keyboard instrument aspect of the patent is not nearly developed as those of the signaling device and guitar. The, there are two drawings in the patent that relate to the piano circuitry, an overhead view of the proposed instrument and a drawing detailing its circuit. Um, as, as I said previously, the implausibility of this instrument, as shown, is readily apparent uh, while the instrument uh, illustrated has a keyboard with well over 100 keys, strings are only depicted for about 40 keys. 
A large single electromagnet is shown through which the strings pass. Um, interestingly, unlike the electromagnetic shown for the guitar, which we'll get to in a second, this electromagnet does not appear to have any pole pieces for concentrating the magnetic field on the strings. The design also includes multiple brake wheels with different contact surfaces, smooth, medium, and rough, that can be controlled in combination in the manner of organ stops. In addition to the brake wheel tone controls, a pair of pedal op operated rheostats are also shown. which would adjust the level of volume produced by the keyboard by restricting the amount of current to the strings. Let's see if you see the pedals here. Uh, no details of the keyboard action are shown, only a simple key lever with small uh, metal contact piece uh, opposite the key ends, which rises when the key is depressed to make uh, contact with the electrical switch, thus completing the circuit. The mechanism resembles that of a clavichord, However, unlike a clavichord, the key velocity has no impact on the volume, and the sound of each note produced is produced by a single vibrating string. Breed's guitar, depicted on the fifth and final page of the patent drawings, is shown with far more realism and detail than the piano. Breed was probably not a trained luthier. He uses unusual nomenclature for the parts of the guitar, including head, for the body, stem for the guitar neck, and sounding wires for the strings. Although the drawings and description of the guitar in Breed's patent appear to be quite comprehensive, closer examination shows that the patent conceals as much as it reveals about the guitar's circuitry and physical construction. It should be made clear at this point that this instrument, although powered by electricity, is not an electric guitar in the way that the term is generally understood. With an electric guitar, sound is created by the interaction of a vibrating ferrous metal string with an electromagnetic pickup, which produces a signal which is then amplified through a loudspeaker. Although there is a superficial resemblance between the electromagnetic, uh, electromagnet and breed's design and an electromagnetic pickup, the employment of electromagnetism in the circuitry of breed's guitar is not to amplify its volume, but rather to create its timbre, its tone. While the strings in Breed's guitar and the other applications of this patent are set into motion by electromagnetic means, it's still an acoustic instrument. Breed's application of his patent to the guitar results in an instrument with several noteworthy playing and construction characteristics. One notable aspect is Breed's specification of metal strings. Conductive metal strings are required because, of, because the guitar strings form part of the electrical circuit. Interestingly, Breed does not specify what type of metal should be used for the strings. Since the strings help to create resistance in the circuit, their composition is a significant factor. Strings made of copper, a highly conductive metal, would have a low resistance, enabling the string to function in the circuit the same way as an electrical wire. Strings of iron or steel, which is not nearly as conductive as copper, would have a much higher resistance and would function in the circuit much less efficiency, efficiently, effectively adding a resistor to the circuit and creating, a mu and creating much more heat than copper wire. Breed su also suggests the possibility of employing non-metal strings wrapped with a conductive material. The strings of the guitar pass through an electromagnet which is on a separate circuit and which possibly uses a separate power source. The guitar's electromagnet has six pole pieces which focus the electromagnetic field on each string as well as decreasing the magnet's weight. The electrically charged strings are attached to the metal bridge that is connected to the clockwork brake wheel mechanism which is then connected to one terminal of the battery. The other terminal of the battery is connected to one of two rheostats, which regulate and limit the flow of current in the string circuit. The rheostats, in turn, are connected to the frets, which in effect uh, become multiple contact points. The string is set in vibration by pressing the string against one of the frets, thus completing the electrical circuit. The frets do not completely sp span the fingerboard, but are divided between the third and fourth strings, and you can see that here 
if you look very closely, you can see that there is a little line between um, the, uh, the third and the, uh, the fourth strings. Uh, yeah, they're divided between the third and fourth strings. This allows the treble and bass strings to be on two separate circuits, each one controlled by one of the two rheostats and allowing for differing volumes between the two groups of strings. Breed states that the function of the rheostats is to equalize the volumes between the different groups of strings and not to raise the volume of the instrument as a whole, as with the volume control of a modern electrified instrument. Since this guitar can only be sounded in the manner intended when a string is pressed against a fret, it follows that, unlike a conventional guitar, open strings cannot be used in playing. Breed, however, seems to have accounted for this in his design by the use of a neck which meets the body at the 13th fret rather than the 12th fret, which was more typical of the guitars of his day. This 13th fret neck seems to imply an E-flat tuning, which would allow the pitches that would normally be open strings on a guitar to be played by playing the, third, uh, the first fret. One of the implications of Breed's method is that, unlike on a conventional guitar, the right hand is not used for setting the string in motion. This allows both hands to be used in playing the instrument, a feature that Breed acknowledges. Two-handed fingerboard techniques would become popular in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, the playing of such guitars as Eddie Van Halen and Stanley Jordan, or instruments such as the Chapman Stick, are notable examples of contemporary two-handed playing. But this appears to be one of the earliest mentions of the technique, if not the first. From the time of Breed's invention until the mid-1920s, this guitar would have almost certainly have been powered by wet cell batteries. As with the large, with, as with the electromagnets of Breed's day, so too the batteries available to Breed would have been large, cumbersome, and not particularly efficient, especially when those compared, uh, especially when compared to those available in Europe during the same period. The inability of batteries at the time to provide large amounts of currents economically would have severely limited the guitar's electrical efficiency and the length of time it could be played without recharging, which may have been short um, as a few minutes. So, what did the guitar sound like? If you play down there, let's take a listen. Now, if that sounds very quiet, it's because it is. I wrote this piece, by the way. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, really bad violinist. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm getting to there. Oh yes. Um, now, what you just heard was a, a recreation of uh, the breed circuitry that I created a few years ago and um, Jerry rigged onto a, a guitar. And you would not believe the difficulties we had to get this thing to work, especially limiting ourselves to technology that would have been enabled to breed. He leaves a lot out. Here. And if you want to know more about it, you can come up and ask me. I will bore you to tears with it. Um, but um, there was a couple of things that we noticed. One, um, when you play this thing, it sparks. Uh, this would be great to play in the dark. Also, um, when you vary the voltage and don't get it quite right, it's possible to suddenly have your strings weld themselves to the frets. <laughs> when they weld themselves to the frets, suddenly they break and make a quite spectacular sound. Um, 
Again, why didn't this work? Well, irrespective of the problems with electromagnets and power supply, the electrical uh, circuit of Breed's design offers some additional quirks that contribute to its impracticality as a performer's instrument. The most noteworthy of these is the tendency for the guitar to go out of tune. A current in the string that is strong enough to react to the magnetic field also tends to heat the string, which in turn causes the metal of the string to expand, making the string go flat. This effect can be quite pronounced. This tendency to detune would have also limited Breed's, uh, Breed's inventions usefulness as a signaling device as we previously discussed, since it was all based on having two identical pitches on either end. Uh, another idiosyncrasy um, inherent in the circuitry is that playing two or more strings on the same circuit, either the bass or the treble side, simultaneously results in an overall decrease in volume since the energy of the circuit is now divided between them. It's possible that the division of the strings into two circuits was an attempt to minimize this problem. The on-off back and forth motion uh, produced by the Lorenz force and a brake wheel creates a sound not dissimilar to a cross between a traditionally played Neapolitan style mandolin, but with a much more rapid re repetition and softer attack, and the scraping of a plectrum along an electric guitar string in the manner of a rock guitarist. The brake wheel adds a fair amount of noise to the sound, as you heard, both from the clicking and sparking of the contact blade against the wheel and the noise from the clockwork mechanism, which you could ob audience, you know, obviously hear on that. Um, if an electric motor, especially the type available in the 1890s, were substituted for the clockwork mechanism, which Breed suggests this possibility, it would likely only replace one kind of added noise with another. It should also be noted that even under optimal conditions, the constantly varying temperature of the strings due to the flow of electricity through them makes a constant pitch difficult to maintain, creating a slow, semi-measured, if almost vibrato-like effect. From the foregoing, one should not assume that the science behind Breed's design is unsound. The reason Breed, that the Breed design was not commercially successful was probably not poor science, but the inability of the nascent electrical technology of the day to fully exploit his ideas. Given all its problems, one has to wonder what Breed was trying to achieve with his design. Unlike later attempts at electric guitar, or guitar electrification, Breed's design was not aimed at making a louder instrument, nor in the patent, nowhere in the patent does he claim that his design creates greater volume. In fact, it's doubtful that Breed was able to make his instrument anywhere near as loud as a conventional guitar. Uh, what you heard, I really had closed my, I mean, that's, it's, it's a quiet instrument. Uh, what Breed had developed was a stringed instrument that was capable of sustaining notes indefinitely while being fingered, a kind of electromagnetic hurdy-gurdy. Although generally not appreciated as such, George Breed's uh, guitar represents an important, steps, uh, important step towards the electric guitar. While not amplified, Breed's design uses the Lorenz force like a modern electric guitar, only in reverse. Breed uses the Lorenz force to drive his string, uh, while Beecham's design uses the Lorenz force created by the vibrating strings to create the electric guitar signal. The ultimate significance of Breed's guitar in, uh, lies less in its functionality as a um, musical instrument than its importance as both the earliest known application of electricity to a fretted stringed instrument and in a foreshadowing of the electric te te electrical technology that would be applied, although in a very different manner to stringed instruments, especially the guitar, 40 years later. Time. Oh, great. Okay. Fine. You bored of me? <laughs> the one thing that all the preceding instruments discussed have in common that is that they lack the one feature that most today would consider the defining characteristic of electrical musical instruments. That is the employment of electromagnetic technology 
Um, in other words, an electrically power powered amplifier and loudspeaker for the amplification as opposed to mechanical activation of the instrument. In other words, for many people, the entire point of an electrical musical instrument is that it is able to be louder than a non-electrical one. This may be obvious, but it still needs to be pointed out that to create an electric musical instrument in the modern sense, things, three things are necessary. One, a sound source to be amplified. Two, a means of amplifying the sound source, a pickup or an amplifier, or a pickup and an amplifier rather. And three, a method of acoustic reproduction of the amplified sound source, a speaker. This change in the essential, essential conception of electrical musical instruments begins around the turn of the 20th century and was driven mostly by the invention and spread of telephone technology. Indeed, uh, it's telephone technology that will continue to be the main driving force in electrical musical instruments until the late 1920s, uh, which by then we were talking about um, movie theater technology uh, coming into play here. Uh, it should be noted that in contrast to more modern times, during this nascent period, amplified was not synonymous with louder. Indeed, due to the low power of many early amplifiers, it could be questioned whether some of these early amplified instruments were even as loud as their fully acoustic counterparts. In order to understand the context of the invention of the electric guitar, the nature of the inventing process itself first must be examined. The popular concept of invention and the inventor in most people's minds is someone in the mold of Thomas Edison, the often eccentric genius creating contraptions from scratch in answer to a pressing need of society. Most, if not all, of the popular writers on the history of the electric guitar have stated that a need for greater volume, here's the controversial part, by the way, just so you all know, uh, have uh, stated the need for greater volume, especially to compete with louder brass and percussion instruments in the dance orchestras of the early 20th century, was the primary impetus for the development of the electric guitar. While it's true that it was soon recognized and advertised that increased volume was a benefit available to players of the instrument, examination of the historical record does not bear the, out the suggestion that making the instrument louder was the primary motivation behind its invention. This is not as contradictory as it first might appear. Although everyone is familiar with the expression, necessity is the mother of invention, it's actually very common that an invention precedes its practical application. One of the best known modern examples of this is the ever so slightly tacky glue used on post-it notes. Created in 1968 by Dr. Spencer Silver, a senior scientist at 3M's corporate research lab, it was originally developed to be a super strong adhesive and was a complete failure for its original intended use. Dr. Silver spent several years trying to find a practical application for his invention, and it was not until 1974 that Arthur Fry, a 3M colleague of Dr. Silver's, came up with the idea for the post-it note. Its first use was being to mark the pages in a hymnal. It was not until 1980 that they were commercially mass marketed. And in the case of the development of the electric guitar, the historical um, assertion that it was due to an increased need for volume can easily and empirically be disproved. The contention is typically made that in the quest for greater volume, the sound box of the guitar was gradually increased in size until it became physically impractical to play. Then in turn, inventors turned to the mechanical amplification to increase the volume of the instruments before turning to electrical amplification, which became the final and most widely used solution to this problem. However, a critical examination of these assertions shows that they were wrong or at best extremely misleading. There are a number of factors that determine the volume of a stringed instrument. String material, construction, instrument tessitura, playing technique, etc. And none of these can be considered in isolation. Regarding the first contention, after, after a certain um, rather small size, making the sound box of a stringed instrument bigger does not make it louder. No one would argue that a double bass is significantly louder than a much uh, smaller violin, or that a bajo sesto 
is much louder than a Neapolitan style mandolin. What increasing the sound box of an instrument does is change its timbre, or its timbre. It increases the lower frequencies of the instrument, which need more acoustic energy to sound comparable in volume to higher frequencies. This has the effect of making the instrument sound deeper and fuller, but has only a slight effect, if any, on the overall volume produced. A noteworthy example of this phenomenon is the dreadnought style guitar developed and made famous by the CF Martin Company. The large sound box of the instrument was specifically designed to provide a deep sounding accompaniment for singing rather than a loud instrument for solo playing. It should be noted that this phenomenon holds true for rega uh, regarding higher versus lower frequencies when electronically amplified. Lower frequencies need much more powerful amplification to be heard at the same apparent volume as higher frequencies. This is why large public address systems used in rock and pop music concerts have much more powerful amplifiers for the bass speakers than for the high frequency horns. This is not to suggest, however, that increased volume was not a concern and goal of electrical experimenters and manufacturers of the time. Contemporary magazine articles mention both recent advancements in sound reproduction and a need desire for ever greater sound clarity and volume in radios and phonograph players. However, it's noteworthy that the same complaints are not made concerning stringed instruments. Although the banjo was one of the first stringed instruments to be amplified, previously no one seemed to be complaining that banjos could not be heard over other instruments. It's clear then that before the 1930s, the quest for graded volume in stringed instruments was driven by novelty and electrical experimentation, uh, both which could be considered zeitgeist of the 1920s especially, uh, rather than a perceived lack in the volume producing capabilities of stringed instruments by musicians themselves. For the greater part, early electrical stringed instruments were the province of experimenters, not working musicians. This was often reflected in their designs, which were commonly radical and minimalist, both ergonomically and aesthetically, compared to conventional musical instruments. Later electric string designs, especially those intended for commercial manufacture, were typically based on more on traditional instruments, more likely to, uh, most likely to help in their appeal to uh, musicians. The vast majority of these early experimental amplified stringed instruments were based not on fretted stringed instruments, like the guitar, mandolin, and banjo, but rather on violin family instruments, most often the violin and cello. However, these instruments often only bear a passing resemblance to their acoustic namesakes. For example, the 1922, 19, sorry, for example, the October 1922 edition of Popular Science Magazine depicts Joseph J. McCran of Lowell, Massachusetts, playing his newly invented radio violin. A cursory uh, examination of the instrument, however, reveals it to have very little in common with its relatives made by Stradivari. Physically, the instrument consists of little more than a stick of wood, possibly a cut down broomstick, with the addition of a pickup and a ukulele key as a tuning peg. The pickup appears to be repurposed from, from a phonograph and also seems to function as the instrument's bridge. The brief article in Popular Science states that McCann transmits music by radio, but this is not to say that he was broadcasting this instrument by radio waves in the way that we would understand this today. Rather, it simply means that McCrane was using radio technology, that is to say the amplification stage of a radio, to reproduce the sounds of his instrument. McCran's instrument is, in essence, an amplified diddly bow played with a violin bow. It should be noted that this picture seems to have confused more than one later research, researcher who was, unfamiliar with the, with, uh, who was unfamiliar with the confusion and conflation of the terms radio and amplified by both journalists and the general public during this nascent period. The cover of Radio News magazine for April 1927 depicts a violin player um, on stage playing an amplified violin through an amplifier and speaker to a huge audience. However, the actual setup depicted in the magazine is much more humble. A violin with a carbon button pickup and a horn-type radio speaker. 
In the first paragraph of the article, the author explains his motivation for the creation of his amplified giant tone violin. And I quote, a dance orchestra leader who also plays a violin asked the writer recently if the violin music could be amplified electrically so that it could be heard over a large dance hall above the music of the piano and the loud wind instruments. He thought that this would be a profitable novelty and would as well improve the quality of the dance music by making the director's instrument dominate all the others. At first, it's made, at first, it may seem that this contradicts the assertion I made previously that it was not lack of volume, uh, that, it, that it was, uh, made previously that it was not a lack of volume driving the development of the electric guitar. However, it's clear from the passage that it was the novelty of the concept, as well as the notion of being able to more easily dominate the band, that was the real impetus behind the idea. The article also seems to suggest that the apparatus works because the violin is already capable of producing a significant volume. The carbon button pickup mounted, the carbon button pickup was mounted on a long thin bolt, which possibly acted as a metal reed that was attached to the violin's treble F hole. Uh, the, author, the author of the article noting that drilling a hole in the top of the instrument uh, would make a better mounting but that the instrument's owner was hesitant to have this done. <laughs> the pickup mounting on the giant tone violin left the carbon button floating about an inch and a half to two inches above the soundboard. This um, positioning would have, been, would have made it somewhat inconvenient for both Boeing and pizzicato playing. As a group, these early electrical stringed instruments routinely ignored playing considerations in favor of electrical and technological ones. This is important, so I will say it again. These early electrical stringed instruments routinely ignored playing considerations in favor in, of electrical and technological ones. Look at the one string cello. Almost certainly, this is due to the fact that the developers of these instruments were engineers and tinkerers rather than traditional luthiers. It is significant that these early electric stringed instruments were much more likely to appear in the pages of popular science than in the Music Trades Review. This suggests that the main appeal of these instruments was their technological in innovation and novelty rather than the actual music created by them. This being true for both the instrument's inventor and the public who read about them in magazines. This is not to say that all the developments in electric stringed instruments during the 1920s were by amateurs. The first commercially available electrically amplified stringed instrument was the Electro, made by the stromberg Wassenet Company around 1928-29. While some have asserted that these were the first electric guitars, the stromberg Wassenet Electro does not meet the definition of an electric guitar in the way that it is usually understood. While the pickup on these instruments was electromagnetic, they did not use the electromagnetic technology in the same fashion, that is, using the string as an armature, that George Beecham's design did. These, the instruments were prominently featured in a full page advertisement within the section featuring the Stromberg Boissonnet Company's products in the 1929 Chicago Musical Instruments catalog. The catalog advertisement shows the Electro's amplifier along with four different models of electro amplified instruments. A guitar, a tenor guitar, a um, tenor banjo, and a long uh, scale plectrum four string banjo. And you can see the four here. The new line of Stromberg of Austinate electro instruments appears to have been fairly well publicized. Half page articles on the instruments appeared in the music trades um, for in both the October 20th and November 17th, 1928 issues. While the November 24th, 1920 issue of the Music Trade Review gives the electro a prominent position in its musical merchandise section. The January 20, 1929 issue of the Crescendo also has a short article on the Electro. It should be noted that all three of these articles use much of the same language, which makes, it, which makes it almost certain that they were written from the same source, most likely a press release given out by Stromberg Boissonnet. The October 20, uh, uh, 1928 Music Trades article states that the instruments were developed by Stromberg Boissonnet Company uh, Secretary H.C. Kurmeyer and were currently in production. 
The article further states that a prototype and guitar and amplifier were being demonstrated in the Chicago banjo shop of Milton G. Wolf, and the instruments had been used by Guy Lombardo's orchestra at the Granada Cafe, and with singular success by Brunswick recording artist The Vagabonds. By the middle of 1929, the Stromberg Wasson Electro had essentially disappeared from the market. No further mentions of it are found in advertising or trade publications. It is very possible that due to the lead time for the publication of wholesale jobber catalogs, the Stromberg Wasson Electro was no longer being actively made or promoted by the time, for the, by the, time the advertisement for the instrument appeared in the Chicago Music Musical Instruments Wholesale Catalog in the spring of 1929. For an instrument that is little more than 80 years old, an elect the electric guitar has more than its share of mythology and misconceptions. The foremost, of mo the foremost of which is that its history only goes back 80 years. Electrical musical instruments have a much longer history than is generally recognized with the earliest example, the Denny door, dating from the 1740s. However, early electrical instruments employed electricity as part of the operational mechanism rather than as a means of amplification. It has often been assumed that the desire for increased volume by musicians was the driving force behind the development of the electrical guitar. But, historical rec but the historical record indicates that while increased volume was recognized as a benefit once the electric guitar had been invented, Novelty rather than loudness um, appears to have been the primary factor in motivating its invention. The earliest attempts at inventing the electric guitar were not by professional musicians, but rather by experimenters. The rise of the electric guitar was not inevitable, but, sometime, but rather the sometimes random result of many twists and turns of technology mixed with a healthy, healthy dose of musical fashion. However, all these instruments I've discussed today can be seen as premonitions and early incarnations of what was to become the divining icon and sound of the 20th century, the electric guitar. Thank you. I would also like to mention that on the Stromberg Boisne, the only known example of not the guitar, but the pickup from is in the other room. And this was discovered by uh, uh, Lynn um, Wheelwright. And when he first brought it to my attention, I was not so sure. And he was convinced that it, he had that it was. And over the years, we have now switched positions where I'm convinced it is, and he's not so sure. So. <laughs> it's going to take some explanation. Yes. <laughs> so, um, any questions? I, I have uh, something about that. No, uh, almost, almost certainly, yeah. um, and that's like I, I had to, I had to cut out lots of the little things, but yes, yeah. no, I, and and um, I look at that, and it, it's one of those things where you look at that, and that may have been, but even the Strove fiddle, even though yes, there were very proficient players on it, it was marketed as an amateur instrument. And I think that it was a novelty, instrument. a novelty instrument, and I think that reinforces the point that. These are tinkerers who are doing this rather than professional musicians saying, now, this is where Lynn's supposed to come in and say, Alvino. It might just have been proof of concept, my friend. Well, true. Uh, very, no, it very may have been well with, but um, I'm surprised that we don't, we see over and over then only proof of concept. And, and the uh, thing. But again, you know, much more research needs to be done, and this is the joy of all this, and we can be arguing over this over beers for many years. Oh, I see you. Uh, I, I, we've, been many, we've been arguing over for 80 years, dude. And you know, we're going to be arguing over it for another 80, and long may that continue. Uh, I wouldn't have it any. That's uh, true. I, I mean, seriously, I mean, you know, and when I say this, that's not a bug, that's a feature. 
<laughs> That's the way it's supposed to be. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm wondering if we can reach some common ground here, Matthew, and, and, and think about the possibility that many of them were seeking, especially those who are affiliated with musicians in the development of these instruments, that they were seeking a novel loudness. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, when I'm looking at these newspaper articles from 1907 on Joseph Kikuku playing in these vaudeville halls, playing Harvey, you know, he's, he's playing with people that have flutes, uh, standard guitars, and ukuleles, which are pretty loud, you know, can be pretty loud instruments. But, you know, he's got his guitar sitting in his lap coming up, and, you know, again, kind of the common refrain that I was seeing was that people were totally intrigued by the, the playing, but yet it was hard to hear. You know, it's hard to hear the guitar uh, as opposed to, you know, the other instruments that were surrounding him. And when you look at the next Hawaiian guitars that, you know, really take off, uh, you know, the Weizenborn, the, the Dobro, You know, oh, the, the, and the acoustic, the standard acoustic Hawaiian guitars. Okay. And they marketed them as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I did, I, and no, you're absolutely right. And again, I say that the moment these things exist, they recognized volume, increased volume, as an advantage and a marketing point. And so, um, and so again, maybe I'm splitting hairs on this. Um, it, it goes back to the thing of the post-it note. They did not invent this glue to be post-it note glue. But the moment they came up with the idea, or they, they, they went, whoa, this really works for this. This is useful. And it was one of those things where it just seemed, well, of course it was made to do that. It, it, how can it not be? Because it works so perfectly. And I'm saying that I think it was more of a situation like this. However, one of the things, and you know, all the researchers in this, this room is going to, all has I'm, all have their favorite examples of this. When you come up with a general theme or trajectory, you find anomalies that predate it, or things that are exceptions, or that you know it's never a straight full path. In fact, whenever you find something as a straight full path, that's almost a sure sign that your research isn't thorough enough. If you're not finding enough things that are you know, suggesting that you might be wrong. Well, you're not. You're not doing your job because self-doubt is just part of this. It, it's sort of like the Stephen Johnson uh, take on history of how we got to now, the PBS series of the mistakes that occur and the twisted paths where <laughs> the, the telephone ends up functioning as they wanted the phonograph to do, and the phonograph ends up functioning as they have expected the telephone to do initially. This is sort of what I hear. Yeah, you oh say. no, and, and and so yeah. So when I say though that you know the 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 uh, the volume is a thing. Again, I don't. I'm not poo pooing for a second that volume was an important thing. It's just that the people who were doing all of these things weren't thinking about that as a. And, and, this and was a, not their overarching goal, as they said. Exactly, out. Yeah. and I and I do that. D, uh, John again. <laughs> well, getting back to the radio violin, you probably know about this, but you know, there's the story of Les Paul, and I think I've read that George Barnes also just took the, you know, the, the phonograph head and just jammed it into the top of a guitar, and, you know, voila, amplification. And uh, you know, if you look at people's houses back then, it wasn't like they had iPads and giant widescreen TVs. They generally had a musical instrument and a phonograph, so it's. You know, it's, it's no secret that like, hey, let's and cabin that. fever would yeah. probably make you do some exactly. very strange things. Exactly. So yeah, it would take about fifteen minutes before you figure out. Sure. Like, hey, let's just jam the, this needle <laughs> into the top of the guitar. And this is, by the way, I'm glad you mentioned that because this is a thing that, and I think Lynn's gonna. This is where you're gonna. This is where you take off with the whole type of pickup things because. Um, one of the things, like our little informal group, has been talking about a lot for the last few years is classification of pickups. And um, <coughs> essentially, not uh, where pickups can be thought of a lot like Italian food. It's all wheat, tomatoes, cheese. 
If you take your wheat and you make it into a dough and you roll it out flat, throw some tomato sauce and cheese on top, it's a pizza. If you roll it over uh, on itself, it's a calzone. If you chop it up into little squares, it's ravioli. If you take the dough and make it stretch it thin and put the tomatoes on top, it's spaghetti. And they're all iterations of the same kind of basic principles. And yet, when you change those things slightly, it can have a huge uh, impact on the way it worked. For example, the Stromberg Wassenay pickup is a metal reed vibrating inside of a magnetic coil. But what's causing that vibration directly isn't the string. It is the string vibrating the saddle, vibrating the bridge, vibrating the top, vibrating a little rod, which is connected to a reed. And so the, 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 the amount that the sound or the, the vibration has to travel to get to this thing has a huge effect on the efficiency of how this pickup works. And the thing about Beecham's design that was so brilliant was he got rid of the middleman. He realized that what is the initial vibrating source is the string. That's what I ought to be uh, using as a source. Now, interestingly enough, he was not the first person to do that. Uh, there is a, um, a piano, an electric piano, made in 1929 by the Neo Beckstein Corporation, or sorry, by Beckstein, called the Neo Beckstein, uh, that was uh, made in Germany that uses a pickup with a horseshoe magnet that works almost the exact same principle. And I've not been able to find any direct connection between Beecham and the Neo Beckstein. They, there, at least one Beck, Neo Beckstein was imported to the United States. There's uh, accounts of it being used in concerts uh, on the East Coast, and there are articles. But it doesn't seem to have gotten that far west that I have found. But I've always wondered, is this? Oh, and also there's a drawing of um, a uh, patent drawing that never made it into the uh, Rickenbacker patent, but the, there's an early patent drawing which shows a pickup with an electromagnet in a configuration that looks a lot like the Neo Beckstein. So who knows? Okay. Do you, uh, do you have any, uh, anything to say about, for example, the, the theremin or even maybe more importantly, the sluice lolly phone? <laughs> <laughs> Very important answer. Yeah. No. Well, uh, okay. Now, what do you want? What, what, what do you want to know about the theremin? Oh, I, I was just. Uh, do you, oh, you're just. just you're just trolling me. Are you factor it into this? You're just stuff. trolling me. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Well, the thing about, I mean, the, the, the theremin is that it's, it's, and even another state of, and this is the thing about the classification of electric instruments, because you can make a big difference between things that use, like I said in the earlier part, things that use electricity to essentially replace a uh, human function or mechanical function, uh, like a player piano, which is essentially a piano that's using either compressed air or a motor or something to plunk the strings. And something like the theremin is on the other end where the sound is completely created artificially in that it's created by uh, oscillation electrical oscillation. So it's completely electrically controlled. Electric guitars are actually kind of in the middle in that you are using the string as the um, source of generating the pitch and the amplitude and all that. But by using this pickup, you are changing it significantly. I mean, every, every, who, every, how many people play electric guitar in this room? Yeah, okay. When you play an electric guitar, it feels really different than playing an acoustic guitar. And you relate to your acoustic guitar differently than you do your electric. When you, if I throw an acoustic guitar at you and say, play something, chances are the first thing you would play is going to be slightly different than, the, than what you would play if I handed you an electric guitar, except for Dee, who would just play any damn thing he wants because he can. But OK, but you know, for the rest of us mortals, that, you, know, you would tend to do things that are more idiomatic to the instrument. So, and um, do you see any connection um, between the fact that uh, the owners of these patents 
were not professional makers and the fact that volume wasn't the goal of their invention. I have something to say about that. <laughs> I mean, I just I had this need to reconcile what's happening here. It's really terrible. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Wait, are you trying to say, are you trying to impose a narrative on history? I kind of am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell your old thesis. You've got the next eight years, John. <laughs> but, I th but I think this is the thing. I think, you know, we have these tinkerers. We have people who are experimenting with these technologies. They're often not musicians, but they're kind of just looking for these ideas relating to phonographs in their room to, you know, uh, to, you know an instrument that's in their car, perhaps, but not really understanding the principles of the instrument. So you have all of these different folks working on all these different projects at the same time. But musicians then come in, and when they say, oh, this actually feels good and it's loud, they take those instruments and they make those instruments popular and they make those designs popular. I, didn't I just say that? <laughs> I don't know. I did. Okay. Well, yes. yes. No, no, that, no. So uh, once once like these it. things are, no, once these things are, well, I, I, say, I say commercially available, I didn't even get into the whole homebrew thing because at the same time, the, as soon as these, instruments, I mean, after the frying pan comes out, um, immediately the tinkerers all looked at that and go, I can make one of those. And they did. And again, um, Mr. Real, uh, Wheelwright here has collected many examples of these homebrew instruments from the crude to the, this has to be professionally made. But this, yeah, but I think the instruments that do work, though, that seem to be the most um, popular, the most commercially successful, are those where musicians actually are collaborating at the beginning. I mean, you know, like what with Knudsen working on his harp guitars and then working on Hawaiian guitars in 1908 and 1909. He's seeing Kekuku play in Seattle. I time. completely agree, and I believe Volume that the reason for those musicians. Yeah. No. Well. Okay. I wouldn't go as far. Absolutely. Okay. Well, for that, I would agree. But I say for the thing for Beecham. I'm still not convinced that volume was a, a significant factor for it because I haven't seen any evidence of where he's saying I'm trying to make right. and those amps quiet. Those you know, and and the amps and the early amps are quiet. But I completely agree with you about how the best examples were involved with collaborations, musicians, because we see that again. Uh, the McCann violin, you can see why. They don't have orchestras of those. But Beecham was a player. By the way, I could also, uh, this is not the time or place. Um, I don't think Beecham was nearly the professional that most people seem to think he was. Now, I'm not saying he wasn't talented. By all accounts, he was a very, very good player. But his um, occupation in the uh, city directories of Los Angeles in 1925, and in 1927, 26 or 27, both list his occupation as house painter, not musician. And, uh, and then in 1929, it lists his occupation as company president of, of, of um, or you know, uh, uh, it lists his position in national. You know, manager. Yeah. Manager, whatever, yeah, whatever. It, 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 it mentions that. So um, he, you know, in other words, when even asked what he did, he was, uh, and and again, I can't find any uh, uh, listings of gigs he did. Uh, I looked through, you know, records. I mean, if he was gigging in the big vaudeville houses, I wasn't finding any evidence of it. But and how many great and professional musicians have to have other jobs? Oh, this is I'm, again. I'm not commenting on his talent. I'm commenting. Well, it doesn't make him not professional. It just doesn't make him a livelihood professional. Well, that's why. That's right. When I say define, define, I'm not talking about professional as a quality. I'm talking about professional as he was doing this full time to make money. And so, uh, in other words, again, I think there's a lot of things about that early period have that have been exaggerated a little bit. And again, I don't think we have the time. You know, this is the kind of thing. I, I, well, like I said about the house party with with the um, with the look, I wanted that party to be at a big mansion, and I yeah. wanted there to be like champagne in the bathtubs and and oh, movie yeah, stars. Yeah, exactly. And you know, and and I want to be stories of, of drunken flappers jumping in the swimming pool, fully clothed. 
It wasn't that way. It was a small little, you know, suburban house. And uh, you know how disappointed I was when I found that. And, you know, I mean, it, it just, yeah. But again, um, that's more of the reality of the situation. I think for the sake of time, we'll, we'll have to change the, the uh, move, move it along. Thank you, Matthew.